Hi everyone, my name's Emily Thiebri. I'm also known as Ranger M. I'm an environmental educator and communicator and I get to talk to a lot of different people about all things nature and conservation. I love to knowledge share and that's what I want to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. You're joining me today on a crisp but beautiful sunny day here at Ipperwash Beach along Lake Huron. No, we're not going to go swimming, but we are going to talk about a vital ecosystem known as sand dunes. I'm actually here today working with the municipality of Lambton Shores and the Lake Huron Coastal Center to transplant dune grasses to an eroded bank. Sand dunes are defined as having less than 60% tree coverage, so they can vary between patchy, open, or scattered, and they're actually constantly battling uh, different weather, so from wind, water, or e ice even. So they're pretty hard to live in, but species uh, of both animal and plant have adapted to live in these environments. We're gonna meet up with Holly from the Lake Huron Coastal Center, and she's gonna tell us all about sand dunes and the challenges that are facing them today. According to the Lake Huron Coastal Center, what is the most common litter item found along Lake Huron beaches? A. Cigarette butts B. Plastic containers or C. Bottle caps According to the Lake Huron Coastal Center, what is the most common litter item found along Lake Huron beaches? A. Cigarette butts B. Plastic containers or C. Bottle caps Cigarette butts are the most common litter item found on Lake Huron beaches. They may be small, but they have a big impact on our water quality as they contain up to 165 toxic chemicals. For this reason, cigarette butts are considered toxic waste and pose a threat to our wildlife and shorelines they call home. Thanks for joining us today, Holly. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your role at Lake Huron Coastal Center. My name is Holly Westbrook. I grew up in Hamilton, Ontario, but I spent a lot of time in Georgian Bay as a teen and as a kid. Uh, I graduated from McMaster University and Niagara College and I've spent all of my time between Sarnia and Tobermory since school. Um, I'm the Lake Huron Coastal Center's Coastal Restoration Technician. I coordinate our Green Ribbon Champion Sand Dune Restoration Program where we uh, restore private and public beaches in Huron-Kinloss, Kincardine and Saugeen Shores. Could you tell us a bit more about the Lake Huron Coastal Center and what exactly it does beyond uh, the programs you mentioned? The Lake Huron Coastal Center is a registered charity and nonprofit organization. Our main goal is to um, protect and preserve Lake Huron's coastal ecosystem through education, research and restoration projects. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what's taking place in terms of dune restoration. So we work all along the Lake Huron coast, but here today in Ipperwash, we are harvesting grasses from the established mature dunes and bringing those into eroded and fragmented areas of the dunes just to supplement the area and create a more resilient ecosystem. And the grasses are able just to take root again? Yeah, we use American Marum beach grass. It has long roots and long shoots that help capture and stabilize blowing sand. And it's a native plant, so it benefits our native species in terms of insects and wildlife. It's quite a hardy, tough plant, so it can take burial by sand, it can take high winds along the harsh shoreline, and it can withstand extreme fluctuations in temperature throughout the year. So it's a great plant for restoration. What do dunes along Lake Huron look like? Is it a very common ecosystem? So the dunes along Lake Huron are not very common. Only two to three percent of the Lake Huron shoreline is beach dune environment, but it's quite a rare fragile and popular attraction along Lake Huron. I've been to beaches a lot, you've been to beaches a lot, so they're under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure just based on the amount of people that visit them each year. And they're a dynamic system, so during low water levels like we have right now, the wind and waves will wash sand up onto the shore and create sand dunes, and then during high water level periods, those wind and waves will erode the sand dunes and bring that sand out into the lake and create sandbars, which are basically just underwater sand dunes. Both sandbars and sand dunes help absorb the impact of waves and protect the shoreline from erosion and various other issues that multiple municipalities and townships face along the shoreline. Wow, that's so neat. I don't think I've ever thought about the sandbars like that. Yeah. Nor growing up, I didn't really think about what, what the sand was. Yeah, and the other thing that a lot of people don't really think about is sand is actually a finite resource. So through our Green Urban Champion Sand Dune Restoration Program, our main goal is to keep the sand on the beach where it belongs because once that sand escapes the beaches, 
it's gone. And there are many beaches that are no longer receiving a steady supply of sand down the shore. So we're just trying to keep those kind of older dunes intact for as long as possible. So you mentioned that these dunes have a benefit to obviously our ecosystems and our wildlife, but do they benefit us and our, our infrastructure at all? Oh, definitely. But the main thing is that they have to be intact and healthy. And by that, I mean, they need to be connected and not fragmented and full of a diverse array of native dune plants. Um, but in terms of protecting us, they do a lot. So when you have a healthy, intact sand dune, that'll protect us from erosion during high water level periods, which can damage infrastructure and be very costly in the long run. They also filter pollutants uh, from runoff as it enters the lake and get rid of those contaminants before they even reach the water. And they're basically fluffy sand reservoirs during low water level periods. And nobody likes to sit on a wet beach. Yeah. So when you have healthy dunes that are storing all this dry fluffy sand, then you have nice beaches to enjoy. So you need the dunes for the beaches. If you like the beaches, you like the dunes. That's kind okay, of how it works. Okay, so happy medium. Exactly. I've heard a lot about coastal wetlands. Is that something we find along Lake Huron shoreline as well? We do, and coastal wetlands are incredibly important. They are the intermediate zone between Lake Huron and its watershed. Um, they do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of how Lake Huron functions. They assist with hydrology, with sediment deposition, nutrient retention, water uh, quantity, so protection from flooding as well as water quantity, and carbon storage. So they're really doing, they're kind of like Lake Huron's essential personal assistant for keeping things in check. Um, they differ from inland wetlands because they're heavily influenced by Lake Huron's processes in terms of wind and waves and water levels, right. short-term and long-term water levels. And um, the main thing that makes them important is because they're kind of a combination of terrestrial and aquatic qualities, they are supporting many you know, diverse plants and animals in terms of insects and birds and reptiles and amphibians and fish. So they're very, very important along the shoreline. A lot of the um, biological processing and diversity is kind of held within our coastal wetlands along Lake Huron. I guess I never really thought about how many ecosystems play into not only supporting our ecosystems and our wildlife, but also, as you mentioned, protecting our drinking water sources. 100%. You know, so. these 2%, 3% of dunes and the very little coastal wetlands we have are very important and we should protect them. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, uh, first, uh, have we seen a dramatic change in like the presence of dunes and wetlands along Lake Huron? Definitely, I mean, dunes as i said before and beaches are quite popular spots and so they've been developed over time and kind of become these hardened shorelines and the natural dune process that i mentioned before struggles to function when you have these human interferences um, and that's why we at the coastal center try to help out this natural dune process mm -hmm. and kind of keep it going despite all the development that happens along the shoreline mm -hmm. i do want to mention that there are many other types of shorelines along Lake Huron. Mm -hmm. At the Coastal Centre, we just focus on sand dunes because they are so fragile and because they are at risk. Yeah, you've kind of touched on it, but what are the challenges facing Lake Huron or Great Lakes as a whole uh, today? There are many different threats and stressors that they face on a yearly basis and all of them kind of tie back to human disturbance and human interaction. Mm -hmm. A few of the main ones, like I mentioned before, are development, but there's also garbage dumping and littering. Mm -hmm. There's also off-leash pets and dogs that can kind of fragment the dunes in those areas and kind of be predators to our native wildlife in the dunes. Um, excessive grooming and nourishment of dunes kind of uh, alters the natural state of a beach dune ecosystem and can render them useless against extreme weather and climate change. So a lot of the interactions that humans have with beaches can be detrimental. But the nice thing about that is because we're involved in all of those threats, we can also be involved in all of the solutions yeah. to those threats, right? Wow, so, I like that. <laughs> yes, exactly, right? We're in control a little bit. So um, I think that, you know, it's that's something to think about for sure. Lake Huron is home to how many islands? A, 30, B, 300, C, 3,000, or D, 30,000? Lake Huron is home to how many islands? A, 30, B, 300, C, 3,000, or D, 30,000? 
Lake Huron is home to over 30,000 individual islands, more than any other Great Lake. Among the largest is Manitoulin Island on Georgian Bay. We hear a lot about litter and plastic pollution in our oceans, but I don't think a lot of people realize that we have those issues in our Great Lakes too, and Lake Huron is one of them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I hosted a pickup here at Ipperwash, and one of the most common things we found was, next to cigarette butts, was uh, plastic, whether it was plastic containers, uh, little tiny plastic pieces, or even just uh, plastic sand toys. Yes. Uh, and I even found a balloon. And I was like, ah, <laughs> oh, plastic. balloons, don't yes. get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. The thing about Great Lakes pollution that differs from ocean plastic pollution is a lot of the plastic in the Great Lakes is microplastic, which is plastic that's less than five millimeters large. And so that ends up, you know, entering our drinking water. So mm -hmm. studies have shown that there is microplastics in our drinking water. A lot more research needs to be done, but that's a big thing. And when you think about, you know, the Great Lakes and how they're connected to the oceans, all the pollution here does impact the global ocean plastic right. pollution issue as well. But like I said, in the Great Lakes, it's microplastics. So it's the plastic fragments you mentioned, which are the parts of the larger plastic that just make their way, they break down and then they disperse. Yeah. There's also fibers from our clothing that yeah. we wash and then that kind of enters the lake. There's also foam particles yeah. from like styrofoam cups and containers, as well as nurdles, which yeah. are those plastic those. For, used for packing. And the other microplastic would be microbeads, which was commonly used in cosmetic products and would be listed as polyethylene on the ingredients list. It's definitely an issue globally, but also locally. And we have to like stop thinking not in our backyard because our Great Lakes, you know, feed our drinking water, mm -hmm. as you said. Um, it also, we eat fish out of our Great Lakes all the time and our fish will eat kind of anything that goes <laughs> near them. And that could plastic be plastic. Plastic like food. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's a hazard that we have to make sure that we're uh, also looking out for. For sure. I also wanted to ask you about Phragmites. So Phragmites is getting a lot of popular popularity recently um, in the sense of it is becoming a much bigger issue. Um, and I was wondering if you tell us a bit about the impacts Phragmites has on our uh, dunes here. That's something I didn't mention when I was talking about the threats and stressors, but invasive species are probably one of the leading concerns in the Great Lakes. And again, humans have a hand in that. Mm -hmm. Phragmites, I believe, was named Ontario's greatest threat as an invasive species. There are plenty, but Phragmites poses a unique threat because it is one of the most highly competitive grasses um, and it has no natural predators. So it requires human interference to manage it. It can be, you know, like I said, extremely competitive and dense. It can outcompete all of our native species for sunlight, for nutrients, and for space. Mm -hmm. I think they can grow, you know, 200 stems in a meter squared plot and up to five meters tall. And I'm sure you've seen wetlands that have been completely overtaken by Phragmites. Yes. And that's a huge problem because Phragmites, with that dense of a stand, can actually alter hydrology in those areas. Wow. Right, so that impacts all of the species relying on those areas. Or even if if it's near a cropland, it could affect our crops as 100%, well. 100%, yeah. So like, its reach is never ending. Exactly. Uh, another thing I heard while talking to landowners and um, community members is like how to get rid of it. It's, it's very hard and very particular timing, I believe, when you, it comes to kind of like spraying or picking it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing for landowners, if you find it on your property, because I'm, I mean, Large scale projects can be done by municipalities and other environmental organizations. But if you find fragmented on your property, that's a big deal for you to tackle that as an individual. I think the main thing to become a good steward and, and tackle issues like this, grand issues like this, is to A, learn how to identify Phragmites. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of resources online for that. So do your research, learn how to identify it. Um, and I think the next thing would be to let people know about it, kind of spread the word that it's there and there's, there needs to be something done about it. But in terms of kind of dealing with it yourself, a lot of times you'll have a small population or a satellite population start and it's kind of encroaching on native plants. And for that reason, it's best to kind of dig out every single individual plant on its own. If it's a small patch, that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. So all you would do is cut it at the roots. This can be done, you know, on land or in water. It will drown it or it will just exhaust its energy to keep re-sprouting on land. Mm -hmm. 
So that needs to be done multiple times though. Phragmites, like I said, it's a very aggressive plant, so it has the tendency to re-sprout. So once you cut a patch and you've cleared it, you do have to go back and double check that the next year and repeat that cutting. Eventually you will exhaust its energy to re-sprout. Um, it just requires a little bit of consistency and persistence, but- Don't, don't get exhausted yourself, <laughs> keep exactly. going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it can be done. It just, you need to, it's a, you know, it's a long-term project mm -hmm. to tackle this sort of thing. Phragmites is also allelopathic. So that means that it uh, releases chemicals into its environment that hinder the growth of other plants, so which is why it can be so competitive. Not only does it grow in dense stands and quite tall and block out sunlight and outcompete our native species, it literally releases a chemical to hinder their growth. Um, Never yeah. ending impacts. <laughs> exactly. A lot of invasive species have that characteristic, but Phragmites is one of them for sure. And, you know, when it takes over in a large stand like that, it can displace native plants, but also native wildlife. I think that around 25% of our species at risk in the province are impacted directly by the Phragmites invasion. So it's very important to tackle those satellite populations at the start to be kind of uh, proactive about controlling this invasive plant. I like to reiterate because some people think that they only impact other plants, but they actually can impact turtles, right? And oh, like yeah. other species that like crawl along um, our sands and stuff like that or uh, around wetlands because they get so densely packed in, like you said, 200 stems per meter, meter squared. squared. It, and like turtles can't even get through that or um, other species. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever walked through uh, a dense stand of Phragmites, but it's impossible for a human. Right. Imagine a small turtle yeah. or a bird or a snake trying to, you know, yeah. slither its way they're, through that fragment. They're maze. thick stalks. <laughs> yes. So it's, you know, you know, it poses, it's difficult for us, but it's even more difficult for them. Now, Holly, I was just wondering if you could share with us how community members could maybe uh, volunteer or get more involved with uh, the Coastal Center. So I mentioned our restoration program and, and Shoreline residents can become a part of that program. But we have a few other programs as well. We have our Coast Watchers program, which is a volunteer data collection program all along the coast, including Georgian Bay, because Lake Huron and Georgian Bay are the same mm -hmm. thing. So we have volunteers in our Coast Watchers program literally stepping out onto the shoreline every single day and collecting data for us, which we share with other people. Um, and that's also part of our microplastic awareness program. So you can become someone who samples the water next to your property and sends it in so that we can analyze it and look for microplastics. Oh, wow. Exactly. Okay. We also have our Coastal Conservation Youth Corps, which okay. is a high school volunteer program. Oh, I love a good education program. Yeah. So students aged 14 to 18, I believe, is the high school range can come out and earn their volunteer hours while learning about coastal science and participating in stewardship activities. You guys are located in Goderidge, right? Yes. Does, do they have to be? So we have sessions in Goderidge as well as in Saugeen Shores currently. We're hoping to expand that. But we've had students come out from all over the province oh, to join wow. the program. That's it's awesome. a really good opportunity and it's it's kind of a more meaningful way to earn your volunteer hours, to get involved with the community, to learn about coastal science. This is something not everyone has access to in their regular education through high school. So it's a really interesting program that way. Just before I let you go, I have another question and I wanted to know uh, what your favorite Great Lake was. Ooh, <laughs> you said you grew up in Hamilton, so right on like Ontario. Yes. Ooh, or that's, is it a hot take and you... You know what? I'm going to throw a curveball here and say Lake Superior. <gasps> oh, okay. Only because, to me, it's a fantasy because I've actually not been up to Lake oh. Superior before. So it's this, like, perfect lake that I hear all about that I haven't visited yet. Yeah. Um, I've worked on Lake Ontario. I've worked on Lake Erie. I've worked on Lake Huron. Never been to Lake Michigan either, but I'm sticking to <laughs> lakes connected to Canada at yeah. the moment. So I would say Lake Superior. It's just this magical, mystical thing to me at the moment. I've been a couple times. It's truly beautiful. I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. Well, thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about Lake Huron and dune environments and the challenges that are affecting them, but how we can also help um, as a community. No problem. Thanks for having me. Lake Huron is home to a first of what kind of park in Canada? A, Canada's first national park, B, Canada's first provincial park, or C, Canada's first marine park? Lake Huron is home to a first of what kind of park in Canada? A, Canada's first national park, B, Canada's first provincial park, or C, Canada's first marine park? Located on the northern tip of the Bruce Peninsula, is the Fathom 5 National Marine Park, the first of its kind in Canada. 
you can see 22 underwater shipwrecks, ancient rock formations, and rare orchid species in this park. Before we leave for the episode, I wanted to tell you about two community groups, the Ipperwash Frag Fighters and the Lambton Shores Frag Mighties Community Group. Two groups that were brought together because of concerned citizens, because of the overwhelming uh, population of Phragmites in their area. And they've actually done a really amazing job as a community group getting together and taking on this problem. So we're going to show you a quick video from them that shows their project and how it's been going over the last couple years. So until next time, see you in nature. My name is Nancy Vidler and I'm the chair of the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group a volunteer organization committed to the restoration of wetlands in our community. Invasive Phragmites is a rapidly spreading alien invasive grass that colonizes in tall, dense stands which degrade coastal areas and wetlands by crowding out native plants and animals. Phragmites infestations can block shoreline views, reduce access for fishing, swimming, and hunting, and can create fire hazards from the buildup of dry plant material. It exudes toxins from its roots that are harmful to surrounding native vegetation. Phragmites has no natural predators, so human intervention is required to manage its control. Our organization was instrumental in having our local government commission and adopt an invasive Phragmites management plan, which we believe was the first in Ontario. My name is Bill McDonald, and I'm a director of the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group and we are here in a 59 hectare coastal metal marsh. It is unique in that it is the only coastal wetland along Lake Huron that is adjacent to a Carolinian forest. At one time this marsh was home to a tremendous variety of wildlife and diverse native plants but became overrun with invasive Phragmites, completely destroying its biodiversity. With the assistance of a National Wetlands Conservation Fund grant, we began remediation of this site in 2016. It is a three-year project, and today we will be showcasing specially designed cutting and harvesting equipment being employed here to control Phragmites. The key piece of equipment is called a truxor. It is a Swedish-built amphibious vehicle that cuts and gathers Phragmites in an environmentally friendly way. The cut material is then gathered on barges and taken to a place on site where it is piled, dried, and eventually burned. I'm Janice Gilbert and I'm a wetland ecologist and executive director of the Invasive Phragmites Control Centre. This is a new entity that I established this year to help uh, guide people to deal with invasive Phragmites in an effective, efficient, and environmentally responsible uh, manner. I've been working with the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group to restore this wetland we see in the, the background here the last five years. And uh, we've been uh, trying to um, bring this wetland ecosystem back to uh, a highly diverse and uh, natural area for wildlife and plants. And it's been a challenge. We've been using all the tools that we've had at our disposal and creating new ones, such as cutting to drown. Uh, with equipment, uh, but we still lack um, a key uh, tool, which is a herbicide that we can use for safe application in wet, wet areas. It's been a real a pleasure working with the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group. They're uh, a dedicated uh, bunch of retired people that have taken this uh, wetland system uh, on. It's, it's, it was uh, a provincially significant uh, designation, globally rare ecosystem, and no one was looking after it, and so they've. Uh, taken upon themselves to raise funds and have been extremely active, thousands and thousands of volunteer hours working to, to restore this coastal wetland system.